nobody knows where to start or where to finish with this. It encompasses so much. But there's two basic rules for health and safety. First rule is you're responsible for yourself, your own health, safety, and welfare. You're also responsible for everyone else's health, safety, and welfare. So with that in mind, we put together a few things. There's about six headings here. So it just goes, we start on being for fire. So your problems with fire is smoke inhalation, burns or death due to. So it's faulty or unmaintained electrical equipment or plant, especially in the galley or engine rooms. So we're talking about, uh, Sean Munch was talking about uh, fan belts being loose and your uh, your alternator not charging your, your batteries. What we're talking about here now is your fan belt being loose, generating heat and causing fire. The fan belt goes on fire and sets everything else on fire around you. So your basic maintenance of your engine and all this thing about fire is like if it was here at the moment, it'd be advice would be get out, get the fire to get out and stay out. You can't do that when you're on board a boat. So the trick is to prevent, prevent, prevent. So maintain your engine. All your pulleys should be up to standard. All your hoses should be up to standard. Fuel and what have you. And uh, your alarms, whatever alarms you have and use. In around your engine, you'd be talking about a carbon monoxide alarm. And the reason particularly for a carbon monoxide alarm is for your exhaust. If your exhaust breaks or starts leaking, you're leaking uh, carbon monoxide out, which will make you nauseous, headaches, and uh, disorientation. So this is all down to prevention. So you maintain your engine, all your hoses, exhaust hoses, your fan belts. Just on the fire thing, if you're using uh, dry powder, fire extinguishers are putting out any of these fires which shouldn't be happening. The trick with a dry powder uh, extinguisher, they're in your boat and you have that motion in your boat and that compacts the powder in, in the cylinder. So it's recommended that on a regular basis you get your uh, extinguisher, turn it upside down and shake it vigorously for four or five minutes just to dislodge all the, the powder from the end. Otherwise, uh, if you don't do that, you'll only get less than a quarter of the, the dry powder out of your uh, extinguisher. Another thing to be aware of, if we were in pool bag and we let off, you say a nine kilo extinguisher, dry powder extinguisher, it would fill the whole of the pool bag boat club with powder. So just be aware of that. Anytime you tell anyone to use a, a fire extinguisher, you use a fire extinguisher with you in the middle, and next it's at your back and the fire in front of you. So you know where you're going and you get out. Uh, just turn the engine there, you just check uh, your pumps, your float switches, all your hoses are connected, and uh, all um, screw fittings have the right size bung tied to them. So if anything happens, you, you bung them off. You have your CO2 or your CO uh, alarm. You have a CO alarm recommended up by your cooker also. Uh, carbon monoxide, it's slightly uh, lighter than, than air. And particularly with the motion of air going through the cabin, it'll rise. So they recommend it to somewhere where it can't be covered. So stay in the ceiling over near where your cooker is. So the um, you, the hot surfaces, your uh, cookers, another fire hazard. John uh, Elson, smokers, another fire hazard. Hot work being carried out, something soldering or welding or anything like that, doing maintenance, another hazard. LPG cylinders, so for your gas, 
they should be all stored outside. LPG is heavier than air, so it tends to leak down into your bilges with a possible explosive uh, atmosphere down there. So your cylinder should be outside on the deck, and if there's any sort of a leak, it runs off in, into the atmosphere. Everything about this is prevention, prevention, prevention. Your cooker at that, you should have your fire extinguisher there and your fire blanket. And the fire blanket, if something goes on fire, you wrap the fire blanket around your hands like that and you lay it down on the thing that's on fire. You don't throw it. The idea of doing that is the fire blanket is protecting your hands so you don't get burned and you just gently lay it down onto the, whatever's on fire and it smothers it and puts it out and you leave it there for minimum 30 minutes. If there's any other if, uh, fire, you turn off your gas, you turn off your source of heat, your source of fuel, whenever possible, and that extinguishes that. If it's burning through that, just wet towel over that again. Just You don't take it off, just keep adding to it, like a, a wound dressing. So, for prevention, like you're, you're talking about your propane, petrol, if you're carrying a, an outboard motor, petrol is more volatile than, than diesel, so you have to uh, store that outside where you'd store your uh, LPG tanks. The, um supposed to be checked before you go to sea, make sure all the connections are right and all tight and not leaking. Make sure all your burners on your cooker are right and uh, burning a blue flame. If they're burning a yellow flame, they're not burning all the, the uh, fuel correctly, so they're giving off uh, carbon monoxide. A yellow flame is uh, unborn gases, so they're going into the atmosphere. In a boat with ventilation, it shouldn't be any huge problem, but you shouldn't be on a boat with uh, a gas cooker or any gas appliance that's not working correctly. So you have your fire blankets, your fire extinguishers, and it's no use having all these things if you don't know how to use them. So most of the instructions are written on them. Most fire extinguishers, just pull out a pin, press the lever, and you point the, the nozzle away from you. You don't look at the seas at work. You point it away, you make sure it works, and then you kind of lay it over like a blanket. You don't shoot it at the, the actual uh, seat of the fire. You lay it over it and cover the base of the fire, not the flames, cover the base of the fire and put it out. So <clears throat> some of them, nine kilo thing, just be aware of the weight of it. There's no use lifting it up and dropping it on your foot. So you have a, a boat and fire and a broken foot before you go anywhere. This is all stuff that you should know before you get on your boat. All should be done. All your fire uh, prevention and safety equipment should be checked annually and certified. And you should know how to use it. So that's basically a bit with fire. Um, electricity, electrocution. Death or fire due to one or two access to switchboards and that. So if you have a problem, know what you're at or leave her alone. Uh, overloading sockets, wording, inappropriate, unsuitable, particularly with salt air. It eats everything. So all this <clears throat> should be done beforehand, checked before you go to sea. Make sure that all your connections are right, and you get sprays that will kill off any of the um, any of the salt. Tech seven do one, and a few of them do them, and, and they work very well. So the, the electrical system should be checked regularly as part of the safety system of work. Preventive maintenance conducted and re uh, where required. Replace all worn or corrosive uh, equipment as required, and to be done by a competent uh, an electrical. Uh, engineer. Basically, 
it's, it, it's just, and all this is just common sense. Like, I mean, if you have a problem with your uh, house, you don't go up to the fuse board yourself. You, you get someone in to do it. So before you're, you go on a, on a passage, you get someone to make sure your boats, you do it once a year. You do your fire exchange once a year. You do your service and all before you, you take off. So the the um, basic things there was uh, chemical hazards. So what chemicals have you got in the boat? Well, we discussed your LPG, which is a chemical. We discussed petrol, which is a chemical. Diesel, washing up liquid. I mean, washing up liquid at home, you have it on the side of the sink and you just pour it in. But that's stable. On a boat, it's not stable. So when you use it, just put the lid back on it. So if it does topple over, you're not fiddling, washing up liquid all over the place. Uh, bleach. They actually reckon you, you should have uh, a safety data sheet for bleach or for any other stuff. You, you should have something like that, uh, which is OTT, but it, it'll tell you what to do, how, how to react against it. Bleach will burn. If if you have two different types of bleach, they can react and give off a vapor that will nearly choke you. So it's all about housekeeping. Half cans of paint, half cans of varnish. They shouldn't be on the boat. Get them all off. Do your work. Clean everything off. And don't be stored in bits and pieces of hazardous materials is what they are really on, on the on the boat if you're going uh, to going to stay. They should be all gone. If they topple over and they start mixing, you have a volatile situation and you have fire and they can actually go on fire uh by just by mixing together. So it does a uh, a movie there, the death under the third, the third floor. But one of these big signs that the new building was open and the CEO and the president and all these names on it, and the janitor polished it up with his um, oil and cotton cloth, his linseed oil, and the thing was gleaming. The cotton cloth went into the waste paper basket and fell combust. The two, the two natural substances being the cloth and the oil bound up together in a tight ball and the fuel from the paper and away she went. So if you're using any of these things, it's all about housekeeping. Tidy up after you're going along. You use your paint brushes, get rid of them off the boat instead of in a corner. Half cans of paint, half cans of varnish, all your bleaches, your toilet clean, any of that stuff all secure so they can't topple over and mix and, and cause a cause a hazard. Um, so confined spaces. The risk of falling unconscious are due to oxygen deficient, deficiency in toxic atmospheres. So you're working in the engine compartment uh, or a water water tight compartment with little no ventilation such as engine room, storage compartments, holes, wheelhouses. So the trick is to uh, pro uh, appropriate ventilation. Let all the, the air in you can to dilute all these toxins. Always work in pairs. So you have one fella, say it's the engine room in the engine compartment, one fella in there and one fella out on the deck. It's no use having the two of them together because the two of them can be overcome. So the man, the top man is, is out there monitoring what the other fellow is doing and monitoring how he's getting on. So you uh, use your uh, alarm systems. That, that, um, you'd probably be uh, carbon monoxide really is what you'd be talking about there. So you vapor alarms in the engine room, the bilges. Other than that, everything else is Instead of shutting it down, you just open all the windows, let everything out. To rush a bear through it, it'll clear it in jig time anyway. So everything is 
secure and tight and there's somebody there to get the man walking in the confined space out. So your physical hazards are falls, trips, slips, noise, impacts, equipment machinery, entanglement, unprotected movement parts, belts, nips, winch drums, engines, being hit, struck by cables, ropes, or swinging loads. So again, it's all housekeeping. All your ropes should be stowed correctly. All your equipment should be tied down. Should be wearing appropriate footwear. Appropriate lighting. So we protected access to stairwells, appropriate gangways in place. So you switch off and isolate uh, all your equipment, main machinery, before you, like, you don't start trying to work in the engine when the engine is running. That sort of thing. This, this is all common sense stuff. It's all what you should just do automatically without having be, have, have anyone telling you this. So we always use a safe system of walking. You was stopping thinking no shortcuts. It's, well, it's not what we do. Everyone on the, on the boat, uh, that'll do. Put that over there, that'll be fine. It's grand. And it's only when something happens that somebody says, well, that would have to said the other night that we shouldn't be doing this and this is the proper way to do it. And, and it's just getting into a habit of doing it correctly and properly all the time. So, like you take in your fenders and, and the painters hanging out, you trip over it, all that sort of stuff. Your mirror lines are taken in, off you go, stow them first, get them off the decks, get them into the holes, out of, out of, uh, out of harm's way. Like, I mean, you trip here, you just fall on your face, you trip on a boat, you fall on your face or you go over. So uh, it's just about housekeeping and it's all prevention, prevention, prevention. So then there's, there's really health. So just have laceration, contusion, abrasion, bones, medical emergency. <clears throat> See, um, you're bringing people on, on, on your boat, so <clears throat> all your own crew. Geez, I, I, I sat at uh, uh, regards to breakfast, I forgot to take medication last night. But if you're bringing strangers on, or particularly children, have you got a problem? Are you asthmatic? Lots of kids are asthmatic and they don't go out with their inhaler. Have you got your inhaler with you? Obviously, be asking the parents, and sometimes they can be as bad as the kids. The inhaler, uh, any other medication you should have, you should know about it and uh, make sure that they know they have it and how to, to use it. The, um, you carry full stock in date first aid kit. You check your first aid kit. Have an understanding of basic first aid and CPR. Now, after your lacerations, contusions, abrasions, anything other than that is Pam Pam Medico. Get them off the boat. They're, they're not. Uh, John Gall uh, John Elson's there. He said uh, we did a, a force aid course there a couple of years ago, and John said the first thing that stuck with him was when someone collapses. Said, I wasn't on my own. Said, the, when you're stuck, the first thing to do was call for help. But just because you're on a boat doesn't change that. If you're on a boat, you call for help on the radio. Pam Pam Medico, I have a man down. So you do that. You then notice assistance on the way, and you go to work on on your um, on your crew member who's down, or your patient. So uh, if you don't know CPR, and you just put them in the recovery position, try and maintain their airway, and do the best you can. The only thing you can do wrong in a situation like that is do nothing. Right? We just have a, a list of. Uh, 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 Trying to get um put this up, but just a, a list of uh what you should have in your first aid kit, and it's just basically dressings, plasters, bandages, uh, face mask, ladder of face mask for resuscitation, disposable gloves, water based bone gel, scissors, eye patches, antiseptic wipes. There, I'll get this printed out to you. I also have put in this um, sunblock and the Oralite. 
the uh, on your boat, you should always wear a wide brim hat, sunglasses, and when you get well, basically to tell you when you get up in the morning, you wash yourself, dress yourself, and you put on your makeup, back that pen. <clears throat> but you should have that on your boat as well. If you're going to see it all, because that UV is reflecting off the sea, so it's coming at you from all angles. So with a wide brim hat, sunglasses, and, and your, your makeup mm -hmm. on. Uh, from your, your, your PPE, you should have your life jacket up to, up to standard, your, your wet gear, jacket, over trousers, boots, uh, your own safety line for the hank on, your own personal life, or I have my own e pair on it. You should have all the like of that personally and in, in good order. Your boat should have all your gear, all your rigging should be checked, your nav lights, your spare lab nav lights with spare batteries for them. Um, all, all of that stuff should, should be just standard. Um, your rigging, that's all, that's all done before you even go back in the water. So that's what we, we kind of just put together for to see where you think you are and what you think you, you have it in mind for safety. So there's loads of stuff we could have done, but if you just run with that, look after half of that, and you'd be well on the way to, to uh, being safe on your boat. So if you have any questions, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do with answering them for you. Johnny, the only way- Is there, is there anything more than having a, you know, one of these fire suppression systems in the engine box? Yeah, but the, 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 these, these are automatic systems that you can put up. Um, they work very well. But they have to be maintained every year. They have to be recertified every year. And what happens is, somebody's after paying a couple of hundred quid for this system and they put it in, and geez, I never used it. There's no need to use it. But it's like everything else: your life jacket or a life raft. You've never used that either, and you still have to have it. But the, the ones in the engine room are, are, and the beauty about them, you don't have to go near it. It does it automatically. So you're not putting yourself in danger. But, uh, like, I mean, the first thing that happens when you open the, the door of your engine compartment and there's a fire, you're feeding it more oxygen. So it, it just takes off on its own. The um, automatic system is ideal. And particularly if you, like your boat, you've com a compartment that's virtually, uh, well, it's soundproof anyway, and it's nearly airtight. And it works perfectly. You say it's just the money in the maintenance? Pardon? It's just a question of the money and the maintenance. That, that's what it's all about. That's all, we're, and all the time of boats is about money. That's true. Jerry, are all of the fire extinguishers now powder-based? Are they the most effective forms of uh, fire extinguishers? And are they, are they effective against uh, all kinds of fires, like electrical or chemical yeah. fires, for instance? Yeah. But you see, that they all do. But OK, you, you have a CO2. So, CO2 just eliminates the oxygen and puts out the fire. But if you're using a fire extinguisher and there's no oxygen, it puts you out as well. You know what I mean? So it's a gas that's going in to cover it. In a boat, <clears throat> with the wind going through it, that gas is moving all the time with the wind. Whereas the dry powder, it kind of put a bit of a blanket over it. Like, I mean, we, we had three nine kilo uh, dry powders on grown on, and he said, That's a hell of a lot. But I mean, you have 40 or 50 gallons of, of diesel, so if that leaks into your bilge and sends on fire, a CO2 cylinder will put out the, the initial fire, but the heat is there, it'll just reignite. If you put your blanket of dry powder on it, it'll just suppress the whole lot and just sit on it, so that there's no uh, air getting at the the, the fuel to, to, to ignite it again. Now, as I said to you, be aware, it goes everywhere. And I mean everywhere. But you can still live in the atmosphere where it was completely CO2. You cannot live in the atmosphere. 
Is, is it just the fact that the powder smothers the fire? It's not a, an actual chemical reaction that you it's get. It smothers the fire, yeah. yeah it yeah. smothers the fire. It, it's, it's like uh, soap powder. It's like a soap powder, but it smothers the fire, yeah, but it sits on it. Whereas the, the CO2 will blow away with, with the movement of the air. I found uh, that when you've used a, the fire extinguisher and have extinguished the problem, you need to keep your extinguisher ready because of exactly what you said, the heat is still there and it reignites very easily. So you've got, to, does, yeah. you've got to keep your fire extinguisher ready to have another blast. Yeah. Uh, I found that with a fire in the house, actually. You, what you said about the heat still being there, even though you smothered it, yeah, it's there's no flames, but the heat is there, yeah, and it, still there it can and reignite, it, it, yeah. It suddenly reignites, yeah. Yeah. I've had that, yeah. Just, just to broaden it a wee bit, um, what are people's thoughts on uh, safety lines, uh, long or short, whether it should run along the deck or run along the, the superstructure? There's so many different uh, uh, variations of it, if they're... Uh, safety line and you clip it on and it's too long and you fall overboard uh, you're getting dragged along under the water possibly whereas if it's too short you're kind of hanging on a little bit closer to the to the tow rail or whatever has anybody any thoughts on that? Yeah for me the safety line should be as far and board as you can make it <clears throat> um, that is your, your jack stay going down the boat and your lanyard should be kept short so if you fall you land on the boat. Must be like alongside the boat holes and everything. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking myself. But the other side the other side of the coin, any sort of a safety line is better than none. I've got into using the safety lines with the three hooks. Yeah, you long and short on it. Yeah. So I I mean, I used to have just the sort of ordinary ones with two hooks. Yeah. But then one on your belt and one on the, the lion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then to meet a lot of the rock offshore stuff, the, the requirements, you have to have the three hook ones now. Yeah. And uh, once you actually start using them, they, they are very good because one of the hooks is on a very, very short line. Handy for, handy for walking around the mast area. Yeah. And a, apart from that on Maybird, I just have two jack stays, port and starboard. But generally hook on, on other things if I can find them. Yeah, we used to use uh, webbing jack stays so they don't roll under your foot. Yeah, if you that's have a wire jack stay, you can go flying on them when, if you put your foot on them. And we found webbing was a lot more user friendly, really. Yeah, I, I agree, Peter. I, I, I use webbing jack stays, yeah. We've got Hardy Sterling to make to make them up to the length of the boat. So once you clip on, you can go from the bow right down to the stern with uh, out on, on, on having to unclip. And that was always one of the problems yeah. on uh, the bracket last was if you went so far, you had to unclip and clip <laughs> onto another one, you know, because of the, the, the way it was laid out on, on the deck. Yeah. And then when we got to Beatrice Bay, we raised them up. But that was a bit of a nuisance when you were trying to climb up onto the coach roof to get working at the mast, to do anything at the mast. Yeah. You could quite easily trip over it. So we laid, we got them made and put back down onto the deck. And uh, that's working out much better, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you'll find with the three hook ones, you, it sort of gives you a better option of, other things to hook onto when you've got to sort of disconnect one of the hooks. It's important with the three hooks to not leave one of the hooks dangling too much sometimes because you, you can snag yourself if you're going up, up to the mast. Mm. You can snag yourself on anything that could be loose on a shroud or a, or a cleat or anything if you have it loose and dangling. So it's worth actually getting it back to itself. With the three hook one, you can have one hook on but you're looking for another anchor point. Yes. So, so you're always attached to, to the bow. I'm uh, real pleased to listen to you, Jerry. Uh, valuable, valuable common sense stuff. Thank you.
I do a, a bunch of uh, solo and then I prefer to be with other folk going on long journeys. One of the things I should say is with the webbing safety line, I was completely content that it went the, line, the length of my, my little 27 foot boat. But Eugene Tuberty had a look at it when he was checking out the boat. And I said, whatever you think, tell me, I just want it to be safe. And what I thought was perfectly safe webbing, safety line, uh, or, or deck line, whatever, uh, he picked it apart as we were talking with his fingernails. So any heavy punter or even skinny, so I'd oh. say I would have parted it if in a rough night uh, I was relying on it. So I switched from the webbing to stainless steel, which will not deteriorate in sunshine. But you're right, you can catch your feet on it a little bit. However, it's always going to be there and you can walk up and down quite conveniently in bad weather. So what I should say is you choose whichever one suits you, but check, for goodness sake, check every couple of years that the sunlight has not eaten through the stitching on it because he picked it apart with his nails, not with his weight or anything. It's good. Uh, that's something for us all to yeah. consider that has, have webbing uh, straps. Yeah. I, mean, I, all, only, I only brought it's them all maintenance. and washed them, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. check, check, check and recheck with, with, with everything, all your rigging, all your lights, radio, all your safety gear. Jerry, I, I think that mine weren't changed for 10 years and they look lovely. But they were yeah. useless. They were useless. Yeah. You sure saying there on the things of safety lines. I remember I've read a good few articles about, as you said, guys going overboard and hanging over the edge of the boat by their safety line and being dragged <laughs> along. As you know, we got the safety lines off the back of us. Um, but when I was when I was putting it on, I only put one safety line, the full length of the boat and midships, yeah. center line, one of them all the way down, using the yeah. two, but I put it from stem to stern. And my understanding was that I would only have enough room to fall as far as the edge of the boat. Because if you went over the edge, I know from personal experience that it's very, very difficult to get back into the boat. Even in rescue situations, as Cormac will tell you, we have very an awful lot of difficulty in getting a man into the boat. Even two men trying to get one man out of the water and into the Absolutely. boat. So my understanding was that don't go over the rail in the first place. In order to achieve that, you have very short lines that don't allow you to go that far. That yeah. bring you up to a stop before that. Now, my understanding would be there would be people that would say a short line doesn't allow you to do the work on your deck, on your boat. So you can only go so far with a short line and then you've got to be unhooking and putting it on and all that. My way of thinking would be that that is preferable, at least to me anyway. I prefer to take longer to do a job than to have the convenience of a long line. Am I making sense yep, here? Yep, do you understand yep. what I mean? Yep. Now, yeah. When you have the three clips on a harness, you can go as far as, you, like I go up as far as the mast. Then I can reach with this next clip forward of the mast and release the clip aft of the mast and then go forward into the bow. Mm -hmm. On my way back, I get as far as the forward part of the mast, reach forward, clip onto the aft part of the mast, unclip the forward part and walk forward. So you've got to go through all those procedures of clipping on, clipping on, clipping off. But you have the added advantage of having a very short line. And if you slip and fall or get thrown when a wave hits the boat, you don't have enough slack to allow you to go over the edge of the boat. And to me, that is the point of this idea, is to keep you in the boat and not allow you to go outside the boat. Yeah. You're, you're also and allowed to use your that's hands. My under, that's my I did that. <laughs> on the egg boy, and I feel fairly confident doing the work on the deck when, I'm, when I use that arrangement. But that's just me, that's my way of doing it, you know. But I do think, I would argue for the short, the very short safety lines. 
That's the point I'm making. Short safety lines keep you inside the boat. But you're also allowed to use your hands to secure yourself as well. Don't depend everything on your safety line because, as, as Marcus says, sometimes they're not dependable. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a safety thing on our boat, and it's one hand for yourself and one hand for the boat. Yeah, yeah. And them's when the you, rules. When, you, when you're moving anywhere on the boat, it's yeah. one hand for you, and make sure you're holding on to something else. Yeah. You, you, you know, I think the slightest, I think, Jerry, the, the one the slightest thing little lift, and, and you're, you're off balance. You know. Yeah. There's one thing to remember with a safety line if you're using a stainless steel safety line. Remember that the guardrails, you always use a rope at the end of the guardrails to isolate them. So if you bring a stainless steel line from the base of the aft stanchion to the base of the front stanchion, you're doing away with that isolator and that can cause a problem and the safety line could <coughs> die through electrolysis if you've got a short in it. So it's just one other point to not bring it from the pulpit to the push pit as a direct use. Don't, don't connect metal to metal. Yeah, use some kind yeah. of rope or like yeah. non-conductive stuff. That's a very good point. You can, also, you can also cut it in that case if somebody goes overboard and you need to drop the, the safety line in a, in a hurry. What if you don't like them? <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> to retrieve them. <laughs> to retrieve them. Gary, yeah. I was going to ask you, how, how often should we practice man overboard drill, in your view? The whole <laughs> idea of this is prevention. You yeah, don't yeah. want to be practicing over. You want to teach them how not to go overboard. Agreed. That's what this is about. That, that's what the plan is. The Cronon had a, a boy on it with 100 metres of floating rope that we throw out. It'll, it won't sink and cook, uh, connect into your uh, prop, but it'll be there out where the person in the water is something for them to grab onto and you can sail around or drive around with your engine and encircle them in the row mm. and pull them safely. But I mean the whole idea of this is not to have any, anybody in the water and when you have one person in the water you don't put another person in to get them. Sure you don't Paddy? You don't. I know you I recognize that I made that mistake, a very bad mistake. I was uh, when we were first on the crown on and we were sailing and I said to them, does anyone know how to retrieve a man out of the water? We not going in the water, pulling getting them to the boat. And we said in Carmi, we're going back fifty a year nearly and we used to practice um recovery of men out of the water. Uh, a very difficult thing to do sometimes. But I did a man overboard drill and I used myself as the man overboard and I uh, put my wetsuit on, I had my fins and my um, my mask, my fins and all that. <laughs> and we did it on the way up to the north in the bay, Dundalk Bay, it was very slack tied. And I made sure to do it on a very slack tide so that if the feckers didn't come back from me, you could still swim to the shore. <laughs> but uh, I didn't give anybody any warning I came out of the cabin, over the side, and I just shouted out, man overboard. No, Stefan was on the tiller. I walked over, clapped Stefan, Stefan on the shoulder. And I said to him, man overboard, and I jumped off the stern. I counted, as soon as I hit the water, I started counting. In five minutes, no, I was lying in the water, and this rope came flying across me. And I could hear people on the boat shouting, Paddy, grab onto the rope, which my reply to them was, I can't grab onto the rope, I'm unconscious. But... They continued on with the manoeuvre and they actually got me onto the boat in under five minutes, which I thought was an excellent performance. And in my mind, I would say what Jerry is saying is 1,000% correct. Practice not going into the water. Practice not falling into the water. But it is no harm once a year, maybe, to do a man overboard drill and, and pull the dummy out of the water or something like that. On the Cronon, we had a line from the top of the mast for it, just for retrieving someone out of the water. A hoop, yeah. uh, a lane pin or carabiner on it, go onto the life jacket around yeah. the winch and yeah. haul you up rather than muscle power. Yes, Jerry. Another, another were, were you on the crown on that day or you did the recovery? No, thing? no. I, no. I was in well, on that particular day, they didn't have that system. That's right, yeah. So what they did was um, they devised a system where they put a rope down underneath my legs and underneath my upper body. Yeah. And they rolled me up onto the, using the two ropes. Yeah. The they rolled roll. me back up yeah. onto the deck. Really. Yeah. Yeah. But the system you're talking about, Jerry, is very quick. If you hook onto the body, hook onto a belt, 
Yeah. Then you can use the block and tackle and get them up pretty quick onto the yeah. deck. Yeah. Put, just put it onto the winch and haul them up. Yeah. Paul, um, I'll tell you that we've done a course and we had as part of it, a sea survival section. And it was done up in Marion College. And mm -hmm. we had a life raft up there. And we were all togged out in overalls, I think it was, and life jacket. And we were all hopped into the pool. And the idea was to get into the uh, life raft, swim up and get into the life raft. Mm -hmm. And everybody was having sort of a jolly old time and everything until uh, poor old Derek O'Connor, Lord of Mercy, and I'm turned on the freezing cold fire hose <laughs> and the nearer you got to the life raft the more uh, you hold you down with this absolutely freezing water compared to the swimming pool it's only a, a, an aside it in no way compares to falling into the water but it, it was quite the story and tighten and freezing and then yeah. when you got into the, to the life raft trying to drag other people in to, to get in and everybody inside there was ringing wet freezing cold and hoping that the lesson was over in about another five minutes so we could get back into the swimming pool and get a heat but it was bloody cold that that house and that's in no way compares to the to the real thing because he said when he was done that course he was in uh, he done, he was in a life raft for two days in the north sea uh, the far brigade went to very dangerous situations but what they do is they do an awful lot of training beforehand for the situations that they're going to go into. And um, we did that in the diving as well. And I think it leads me to the thing of doing an actual man recovery, say once a year, would help the people on the boat to actually have the experience of taking someone out of the water. You know, it's different from don't go in the water. It's an exercise which gives people the experience of handling the situation. And I have to say, like I say, I keep coming back to the thing. The people on the Cronon got me out of the water within five minutes. Uh, if you get somebody out of the water, one of the biggest dangers is the cold and hypoth hypothermia. What's the best way of warming a you know somebody you've taken out of the water? What's the best? What's the recommendation as the best way of, of handling get, that? Get the clothes off them, dry them, put warm clothes around them, wrap them in the space blanket, hot drinks. That's provided that they're after swelling water and they're not sick or anything like that. But dry yeah. them down, warm clothes on them, wrap them in a space blanket, let them build up their own heat. Yeah, but it is so. So the recommend is to take their clothes off. Yeah, get get them out of the way, dry them. Yeah, you know, get the core temperature up again. Yeah, I do a bit of winter mountaineering, and and what they say is to wrap them up but then in general their clothes aren't wet in those conditions. Yeah. Just a, a small point on a life raft, although it might not be a small point. Uh, a friend of mine who's been living on board for about 10 years now, they did a sea survival course at Warsash, I think, and his partner's five foot and she physically couldn't get into the life raft because even with the ladder over the side, she couldn't. She just could not do it. She was just physically wrong to do it. So yeah. she had to have someone in the life raft to get her in, in the first place. The, the recommendation is the strongest people get into the life raft first and pull the rest in. That's what the recommendations are. So the strongest people are forced into the life raft and they haul everyone else in. Yeah, this wasn't a strength. This was a sort of length of the legs and things like that yeah actually that that's the the, the float on on the life raft when you're in the when you're in the water it, it is quite a mountain to climb yeah even, even stepping on the ladder because you're, you're you're sort of coming out to go over it you know i don't think she could even get a feet on the ladder that was part of the problem <laughs> yeah. it's also very tricky getting into the life raft if you have your life jacket fully inflated Mm, so, yeah. so they recommend that you partially deflate your life jacket in order to get over the lip into the into the raft and then obviously to reinflate when you get in so that you're fully inflated. But a lot of people with the big buoyancy of their life jacket on you can't actually make it over the lip into the into the raft. Do you think people would be inclined to do that, bearing in mind that the life jacket is keeping, <laughs> yeah. them, al keeping yeah. them alive and keeping them afloat? It's and someone said to you, Deflate from your life jacket. <laughs> F off. Get me into the get me into the life raft quick. That's why you have a knife in your lifeboat kit. And another one with the with the life raft, I remember from, from that sea survival course was when you had to write it. If the raft is upside down and you have to write the raft, and it's quite important. The raft has a, a very 
substantial gas canister in it and uh, a lot of people actually if they do have to write the the raft end up hitting themselves in the head with the canister so it's important to do it kind of gradually and and to feel your way through just to make sure you don't get a wallop in the head of the of the canister while you are writing it on the the man overboard thing we had a situation in conway where we were on a mooring the tide was running probably about four knots and four people capsized a dinghy on the bows and three of them ended up hanging on to the side of the boat and screaming at us to stop the boat although we were on a mooring but it was running and we persuaded one of them to work his way to the stern and he could get on board but he couldn't persuade the other two to let go at all and we we tied them off but nothing would persuade them to move down the boat at all they were just hanging on to the boat for grim death and That's even the point, the fact, yeah. you know, even the fact that they'd seen him get on board didn't persuade them. It took yeah. us about an hour, and we didn't have to even look after the boat. She was on a mooring. So it was very. That was quite an eye opener. Fear, fear is very strong. Very strong emotion. I mean, uh, there's been quite a few single-handed sailors who have hopped overboard for a. Uh, have a swim and uh, realised that even though the boat was to all intents purposes uh, just uh, steady in the water not making any way by the, by the time they went to swim back to it for some reason their boat seems to have picked up some speed and they weren't able to catch it <laughs> so that's that's why most of them jump overboard now with a, a lifeline but in the beginning like 20 or 40 or 50 years ago uh, there's been several instances of, of single handers jumping overboard for a swim and not being able to catch up with a boat. Just on the webbing, we, we take our webbing off every year in the winter when it's when the boat's not in use because uh, so for two reasons. One, one, to clean it and test it, but also webbing over the winter will retain moisture and on wooden decks it uh, it can create an awful lot of under webbing rot on the deck so it's it's a good way to get uh, to keep your decks a little bit less green over the winter period well, we, we take all those off uh, along with the sheets and the and anything else like that we we take them off uh, for the winter and i usually bring them home and some years i use surf other times i use parcel Depends what's in the press, but I believe Would you not use is, toys. Das is, das is very nice. <laughs> Would you not use Quite, toys? Quite logical, Daz. <laughs> I I do the same thing as Kian with the webbing jack stays and take them off for the winter and clean them. The other thing that I do is I use a strip of um, UV fabric and that's stitched on over the loopy end stitching of either end of the jack stay so the uv like the uv cover you have on a rolling headstall so that's just trying to protect it protect the stitching from the uv light sort of in the spring and the summer when you're sailing it it good does idea. work that's a very good idea well kyo has discovered something you know a lot of garages around now have these big huge big washing machines in, in the yeah. forecourt yeah. yeah, they're good though. Yeah. I use them. Yeah, well, there's quite a few. There's one in, uh, up there at the SO one in, in Sandy Mount at the tower. So it's a big machine. It done the whole lot of them in one shot for uh, I think it was eight quid. So it was well worth it. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Good idea, Paul. Yeah. Trying to put your sails in. It's like it wouldn't fit. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you would. Yeah. Paul, well, did you put plenty of um, comfort in? Make them soft on your hands. And it smelled lovely as well, Jimmy. It smelled lovely as well. <laughs> Is there any way that you can get sails washed now? Any, any machines big enough for washing sails? No, I think you have to go to the UK. I think so. so. Doesn't the crowd from England collect them at the end of every season? Yeah, they yeah. do. And, uh, bring they them do. back then. Yeah, they, they, the lads in Portsmouth, they send a truck and it goes to all the sail makers in the North and the Republic. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, I, I used to have a very good contact in uh, St. Edith's Hospital in Port Ran. And it was monster <laughs> in there. And so yeah. you could just drop them in and collect them the next day. And we folded them lovely and neat and a lot. But uh, that's gone now. <laughs> Where in the Nod Hall? Do we know anybody with a swimming pool? That'd be just as handy, <laughs> wouldn't it? Thank you very much, Jerry. Very informative. And as usual, uh, you've uh, put it across in such a way that you've made us all feel a little bit guilty for some of the things we haven't been doing. <laughs> well done, everybody. Okay. 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 Thank you all. Bye, Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Good luck, Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. All the best. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll all get out sailing soon. <laughs>